If you're anything like me before I finally bought 7 Days, you've probably had the game stashed on your wish list for months. So today I'm going to take you on a deep dive into the game, the controversy, the future, and the fun pimps, and give you all the information you need to determine if this game is worth your hard earned money. Now let's begin. The game takes place in a post-apocalyptic world set in the fictitious Navasgain County, Arizona, and the indication is that there was a nuclear third world war and a global pandemic. And although there is a hidden story going on in the background, like this bad guy Duke Cassador and this good guy named Noah, it's yet to be fully developed and implemented in any meaningful way within the game. So at its core, Seven Days to Die is a survival crafting game, but it also has an element of tower defense and extensive base building mechanics. The worlds are open and usually between about 36 and 100 square kilometers, and they're procedurally generated, but the buildings are all handmade. It's single player or multiplayer, and what makes the game truly special is that it's called a voxel based type of game, which basically means that there's just a 3D building grid, which when you combine that with thousands of different block building shapes and decorations, really makes for some incredibly intricate builds. The game is Steam Deck compatible and has full controller support, and it's currently available on PC, Xbox One, and PS4, but this review will only be focused on the Alpha 21 PC version. The console version of the game is at a much earlier development state. The Cliff Notes version is that the Fun Pimps sold publishing rights to Telltale Games, which promptly went belly up, and all rights were sold off to another party, and it took ages for the devs to actually get the legal control of the publishing rights back, and so now they have them, and they're working with a team from Australia to get the game published again on console, they've showed us some footage of that, and it's expected to be released sometime in 2023 on the latest generation of consoles. So if you are a console user, do not purchase the console version until it gets re-released as the current console version will not be getting updated. It'll just get re-released as a new game. Seven Days to Die is in early access and has been for almost 10 years now. This is a major point of controversy among its players, but despite being in early access for so long, the game has been consistently updated now about 21 times with the last two versions, Alpha 20 and Alpha 21 being the most transformative big updates yet. The game was started on the back of a Kickstarter campaign, and despite aiming for a much shorter release window, they are delivering on almost all of their original promises. Many are quick to criticize their seemingly slow development, but keep in mind, this is an indie dev team. The employees are very quick to praise their company, and they're very proud of their work. I love this company. Uh, this has been a great job, and I'm excited for what's coming next for y'all. And the same really cannot be said of AAA companies that are routinely criticized for poor working conditions within this industry. So I touched on this game being a survival crafting game at heart, so let me dive into that some more, and we can discuss some of the game features. There are basic survival mechanics such as hunger and hydration, critical injuries and weather, and there's a day-night cycle lasting 60 minutes, but there's no form of fast travel, time skipping, or sleeping at this time. Everything that you need in the game can be obtained by crafting, looting, or utilizing the in-game merchants. There's a robust character development system where finding magazines increases your crafting skill, reading books will give you special perks, and leveling up your character will give you points to purchase skills with. And every seven days there's a tower defense mechanic that sends a horde of zombies to your position all night long. Therefore, the core game loop really is to explore, loot, craft, build defenses, fight the horde, level up your character, then rinse and repeat. There is a handmade map called Navasgain, but you can create a procedurally generated map using the in-game map generator, and these come out really well. There are four primary biomes, the pine forest, desert, snow, and wasteland, and the difficulty in them increases in that order. And the map is filled with thousands of professionally designed buildings for you to loot and explore. Everything from log cabins to towering skyscrapers to underground military facilities. And the game is highly customizable with sliders and game settings and there's easy to access developer controls as well. And so there are basically five core character types to choose from, but you can mix and match your skills if you'd like. There are perception, strength, fortitude, agility, and intellect trees, and each encourages a sort of unique playstyle with a mixture of melee and ranged combat, and each has a specific set of skills. The gunplay is pretty mediocre if I had to say so. It's definitely not as good as modern shooters like Call of Duty or Tarkov, 
and the melee combat is also not so great. Nothing like the modern slashers out there like Mordhau or Chivalry. The enemies do have some level of sophistication and AI. They have sight and hearing. There are several variants, but you'll definitely be seeing the same ones over and over again. And although the AI is kind of simple, many players joke about the zombies, quote, structural engineering degrees, which is basically poking fun at their ability to detect structural support columns when determining what areas to destroy first as they're attacking your base. And speaking of structural support, the game has a fully destructible environment and structural integrity system. You can destroy any block and mine all the way down to bedrock or build a tower high up into the sky Water will flow from one area to the next, allowing you to divert water, and there are several different construction materials to upgrade your building with. And if you're really not into building, you can always just take up residence in an existing POI and call that your home instead. For the purposes of this video, I've interviewed some of my friends who are both veterans of the game and staples in this community to get their thoughts on various aspects. My first guest was Cap, someone who's been playing the game since the first day it was released nearly 10 years ago, and I asked him what he thought about the overall gameplay and here's what he had to say. A nearly perfect genre defining game that allows you to go wherever, do whatever, and play however you want. It has one of the most creative and constructive communities I've ever encountered. The game's appearance has come a long way over the years, especially recently with a massive overhaul of lighting, reflections, and textures to give the game a more modern feel. The game has never looked better, but given the nature of the game having you know, dozens of enemies with complex terrain and building physics, you shouldn't expect graphics that you would see in a more strictly hack and slash type of game like Dead Island 2, for example. In terms of the audio quality, I'd say it's pretty lackluster. There are a few sounds that I've heard in other games, leading me to think that they're probably purchasable Unity store assets. There's ambient music, action music for when you're fighting, and Horde Knight music. And I recall enjoying these tracks early on, but after so many years, I just play with the music off now. The soundtrack is definitely not like those of for example, Paradox games that I can listen to on loop for hours. So I talked briefly about the game loop, you know, crafting and exploring, building a base and so on, but I didn't really touch on replayability there. A lot of the game focuses on progressing your character and doing quests for the traders. And I'd say it would take at least 40 in-game days, which is, you know, 40 real life hours to progress from the early game into the late game. And that's at a veteran's pace. For a beginner, it could take like a hundred hours or more, I know my first playthrough went over 100 days, and even then, you'll only really be scratching the surface. There are still new buildings in the game that I haven't even explored yet, and I'm over 3,000 hours into it. If you combine the exploration potential with the variations in character builds, you should have several playthroughs worth of material to get through. There are virtually limitless building options, and there are many challenging self-imposed game modes that can completely redefine the experience, such as board every night, no traders, no crafting, or a nomad playstyle. But once all your gear is maxed out and your base is built, you're pretty much all done with that playthrough. I think it's very common for players to do a run of perhaps 50 to 100 hours, then maybe call it quits, take a break, go on to a different game for a while, and then come back and do another playthrough. Especially when these big updates drop and there's a a ton of new content to explore. Performance is another topic of controversy. The game's performance is notoriously poor in some situations, particularly on lower end rigs, and the Steam minimum and recommended requirements are kind of unreliable. Even a top end rig can struggle with low frame rates in some situations, such as like massive horde nights or dense urban areas. And it's really not just FPS that's been a problem. Many users do report errors and bugs, and the developers do routinely address these in their, albeit infrequent, game updates, but they're on the record for saying that most of the work on game optimization will occur when the game is finished and released in its gold version. But likely the best optimizations will come with gold when we've we can actually content lock. All that being said, the game is definitely stable and playable in its current state. And in terms of bugs, you're much more likely to see kind of strange occurrences like zombies getting stuck in walls or traders falling through the floor a little bit rather than critical console errors or crashes. I asked a friend of mine, Wayward Echo, to share some thoughts on performance because he often jokes sarcastically about how the game is, quote, a perfect game with no bugs. And so when I asked him about Alpha 21, the most recent update, he said this. 
Performance feels similar to Alpha 20 with some minor improvements, but it still seems to struggle. In terms of bugs, the few I've encountered have been minor. Overall quality seems solid. With over 15 million copies of the game sold, it's needless to say that we have a big community. My experience with the community has been two-sided. On the one hand, there's one group of people who are unhappy for one reason or another. Either that the game hasn't been fully released yet after 10 years, or they're struggling with performance issues which seem to just be getting worse, or they're unhappy about how the game has evolved in all this time. But if you're judging by the Steam reviews alone, I think this is the minority. My friend Genosis has been a part of this community for a long time. I even remember watching his videos before I even became a YouTuber. So I asked him what his thoughts were, and he says, for better or for worse, the Seven Days to Die community is like family. Some are weird old uncles that are stubbornly set in their ways, and others are like brothers and sisters who would give you the trench coat off their backs to see you succeed. Some people are very critical of the developers for not listening to the community with regard to game feedback, and the devs are on the record for stating that they rely mostly on their internal team to make decisions on the direction of the game. And personally, I think that that's fair. But as far as main features and design changes, we rely on our team to make those decisions. But if you feel like you need to have some say in how the game is being developed, this might not be the one for you. But I do trust that the devs have the player's best interest in mind in developing this game. There are some people who have had bad experiences with staff on the official forums, and I have to say, I'm one of them. In my personal opinion, having read thousands of forum posts over the years, there's a lack of patience and professionalism exhibited by staff and moderators over there. And I'm not alone. You can't go through five negative reviews on Steam without someone complaining that they've been patronized on the forums. The multiplayer scene in this game is huge. The game officially supports up to eight player multiplayer, and although there are no official servers, most private servers exceed this maximum count without any problems. The server browser is clunky and has received some criticism, but it seems to work well enough for me. And the game uses easy anti-cheat software, which has received some criticism as well. But honestly, I don't really know much about it and I've never had any problems with the software. I have had a couple of cheaters on my servers before over the years, but they were swiftly caught, banned, and blacklisted. And in my opinion, this is not a rampant problem. Bad Player is one of my server hosts, and he's a terrific admin with a ton of experience in Seven Days to Die servers, so I asked him if he'd share some of his thoughts on the multiplayer scene. And he says, there are a large number of servers available, and most of them are well populated. One of the best things is the sense of community. When you play on a server with other people, you can work together to build bases, fight zombies, and explore the world. There's servers for all different types of players, from casual gamers to hardcore survivalists. To me, one of the highlights of Seven Days to Die is the modding scene. There are thousands of mods out there, from massive overhauls like the ever-popular Darkness Falls mod, to minor interface tweaks. Snowbee was kind enough to share some of his thoughts on this, and he probably has his finger on the pulse of the modding community more than anyone else. He says, Without game modifications, Seven Days to Die would not be what it is today. With so many missing features for so long, we thankfully have a modding community which has stepped up to try and fill the gap and make Seven Days to Die into a game with longer life. And while I don't think that modding is a requirement to enjoy the game, it probably was a requirement for me after about the thousand hour mark. By then I had learned and mastered the vanilla game mechanics and I was ready to challenge myself and spice up my experience with some hardcore mods. Unfortunately, there is no Steam Workshop integration at this time, but there are plans to add this in the future. But mod installation is generally fast and easy, and there are loads of tutorials on how to get started there. The game is generally priced at $24.99, but during the Steam Winter Sale of 2022 and the Spring Sale of 2023, it went on sale for $5.99. So this puts its price roughly on par with other popular survival game titles like Sons of the Forest, Ark, Valheim, Project Zomboid, V Rising Raft, and Subnautica. There are currently no subscriptions or in-game purchases, and you can get a small discount for buying two games in case you want to play with a friend. There have been several mentions of adding DLC or expansions after the game is released in its gold version, but we have no word on specifics just yet. Yeah, uh, the new character system is going to provide uh, options for us to you know, get into 
you know, some additional skins in the game that could be reasonably priced DLCs, if you will. So let me just summarize with a brief list of pros and cons. The pros are that there is virtually limitless creative freedom in the game's building system. And I don't think that any other game really comes close to what you can do here. And there's a tower defense element, which gives you a reason to build and something to prepare for. The crafting and progression system is fun and intuitive, and multiplayer adds a tremendous amount of immersion to the experience. And there's a mod for everything, which enhances the already terrific replayability value. The cons are that the game is still a work in progress, so systems are liable to be overhauled, and historically, old save game files are not compatible with the new major updates. And even though we do receive periodic free updates, lately they've been spaced out by 18 months or more. Optimization and performance are still not where we would like them to be, and with each new update comes changes that seem to sometimes hurt performance even more. But if you do have a fairly modern gaming computer, the game does perform well. So here's my overall breakdown of each component we've discussed today. Now, this is pretty arbitrary stuff, and I'm very much biased, so take this all with a grain of salt. But for what it's worth, these scores average out to an 8 out of 10, and I think that's very appropriate. Seven Days to Die is a unique and special title. I've never played anything like it. It's deficiencies are masked by its entertaining and immersive gameplay, and even after thousands of hours, I still feel like I have thousands more ahead. Seven Days to Die is definitely worth a buy. I sent out a poll to my community to see what the consensus was over the latest update to the game, Alpha 21, which was released in June of 2023 in its experimental version. 90% of respondents said that they were enjoying Alpha 21, with only 3% saying that it was bad, which to me proves that the developers are taking the game in the right direction. Christian here appears to be enjoying the new magazine progression system, and many other comments praise the new look of POIs, dismemberment, traitor changes, the removal of empty jars, and the increased difficulty of the game. So what are your thoughts? Do you agree with my assessment? Let me know in the comments, and if you end up picking up the game, drop me a sub and share this video with your friends. Then check back here on my channel for all of the gameplay, news, tips and tricks, base builds, and tutorials that you'll ever need to learn the game and become a pro. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you hopefully in the next video. Take care, everyone. Hey everyone, I just wanted to say thank you for watching, for leaving a like, but most of all, thank you to the long list of amazing supporters that you see right here. I hope this episode has earned your subscription, and I can't wait to show you the next one. Best wishes to all, and goodbye.